Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mayor for having me here uh, on board as an external uh, member of this FTA. It's really organized beautifully, and also the symposium is very, very, very impressive. So I have the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our effort in, in uh, silicon plasmonics detectors and these detectors are uh, designed to operate in the IR in the 1.5, 1.3 uh, micron wavelength regime but yet these are all silicon detectors so no 3.5, no germanium, pure silicon. <coughs> so basically what we use is actually the concept of silicon plasmonics Silicon plasmonics, and let's look at the very naive representation of silicon plasmonics, is just like a metal, a piece of metal on top of silicon. So we have a single interface semiconductor metal, and if we uh, calculate the omega versus k diagram of this uh, single interface mode, uh, <coughs> just a classical uh, plasmonic mode, and actually we typically look at this region. And why is that? Because this is the region where uh, silicon is transparent. So we see that we are not much different from the light line. We are almost uh, parallel to the light line. So there is no much plasmonic gain, sort of speaking. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, we can see that uh, propagation length is only few microns, and confinement is not that great. Confinement, let's say, at the wavelengths of 1.55, we are talking about decay lengths of about 200 nanometers into the silicon. So it looks like there is no much benefit of using the concept of silicon plasmonics, but it turns out that for some application, the, there is huge benefit in doing so. And specifically, I'd like to talk about photo detection using uh, layers of silicon and metal. <clears throat> so basically, if we try to detect light with silicon, we know that we are, if you are looking at the near IR, at say the 1.5 micron regime, of course, silicon is transparent, so we cannot detect uh, light in, in silicon. Uh, there are some ways to circumvent this problem, uh, for example, using two photon absorption or insertion of some kind of mid-bang up states in the silicon. You can enhance these two phenomena by using some ca cavity enhancement uh, arrangement, or you can use different approaches such as integration of germanium, having silicon germanium structures, so you can engineer the bang up at will, or almost at will, I wouldn't say at will, there are limitations of course. And uh, finally you can integrate 3-5 materials, so like um, uh, groups in uh, Santa Barbara is doing, and also a group here in, in Israel, the group of Abit Sadok. So basically they integrate 3-5 uh, on top of silicon. <coughs> but we would like to stay with pure silicon, uh, so no need for 3.5, no need for germanium. <clears throat> and we are using a different concept, a very old concept, the concept of short key detector. So basically, if we take a piece of metal and a piece of semiconductor, they have different work function. We bring them together, we end up generating this short key barrier. Now in silicon, depending on the metal, on the doping of the silicon, and on, even on the fabrication process, we are talking about short key barrier ranging from, say, 0.3 to 0.7 electron volt, which is lower compared to the energy of a photon in the IR. For example, uh, at 1.5 micron wavelengths, we are talking about 0.8 uh, EV energy for the photon. So it's higher than the Schottky barrier. <coughs> now we can use something called internal photo emission. There are hot electrons excited by the photons, and they have sufficient energy uh, to go over this Schottky barrier and being collected as a photocurrent. So the Schottky barrier, the Schottky junction separate the charges and so we can get actually photocurrent out of this device. But there are lots of problems. <clears throat> for example, there's small interaction volume between photon and electron in the metal. For example, if we just have kind of a metallic uh, mirror and silicon, so we shine light just perpendicular to this interface and then most of the light actually get uh, reflected. Here we can use actually plasmonics. Plasmonic modes can help us in order to enhance this effici the efficiency of the process. And actually, it's not very new. Uh, for example, this paper of SIPE from 1981 already pointed out that 
using photocathode, he can end up with some plasmonic enhancement of uh, the photo detection efficiency. And very recently, there has been some work also in silicon, uh, plasmonic enhanced silicon photo detector. I'd like actually to address that in the 70s and 80s, there were also works about uh, silicides that were working with silicides, but that's a slightly different story. So anyway, I've listed some of the recent paper, and maybe now the most famous is by Naomi Hallas and Peter Norlander from, from uh, Science. And our work actually is in time, back to back, with their work actually we submitted two days before their work. So <clears throat> let me show you how it works. Basically, we are using the concept of LOCOS. LOCOS stands for local oxidation of silicon. Uh, <clears throat> and basically what we do is we are based on some kind of oxidation instead of etching. So we are not etching the silicon. We are defining uh, our mask by E-beam lithography followed by etching of the silicon nitride layer in here, just like that. And finally, we oxidize, end up with the structure as, you shown, as, as shown here. We remove the nitride, and finally, we deposit the metal. Now the metal actually, because of this process, is self-aligned with the structure. So the metal is exactly on top of our uh, silicon. It does not cover the sidewalls. We thought that's, that's what we want. I'll show you later that it turns out that it's not what we want. Uh, <clears throat> but to begin with, that's what we wanted. So here we have the short key contact. This is the ohmic contact over here. <clears throat> uh, this is the silicon waveguide, which is coupled, just but coupled, to this short key uh, detector, which is also a plasmonic waveguide where the signal is decaying over a length of few microns. <clears throat> so, of course, there is some mode mismatch, so there is some reflection uh, and, and uh, some radiation at the uh, interface. This can be actually improved in several ways, uh, <clears throat> but that was not the goal of the work I'm showing here. <clears throat> here you can see, actually, a layout of our device, a top view of our device, with the aluminum contact, that's the ohmic contact, and the gold contact, which was our short key contact, and the signal was split into the detector arm and the reference arm. Reference was used just as a, for measurements to, to know exactly how much light we actually have inside our uh, device. And here I'm showing you uh, electrical measurements. So what you see is basically an IV uh, diagram under different temperatures from which, you, from which you can actually extract the parameters of the diode, the ideality factor, and also the short key barrier. So we ended up with numbers of about 0.3 EV for the short key barrier and ideality factor of about 1.7. <clears throat> Next, we move into the optical measurements. Uh, so we shine light, but coupled into the silicon waveguide. And this light was propagating in the silicon waveguide and then was coupled into the plasmonic waveguide. And here you can see IV diagrams under different illuminations. So you can see that under reverse bias, you see that we have higher and higher uh, current as we increase the uh, power of our infrared signal. Now, from this, we can actually extract some kind of responsivity curve, which was about 0.5 milliamp per watt at the wavelength of 1.55, and actually slightly better, not slightly, actually much better at the wavelength of 1.3 micron. Okay, so that was already better than what was reported to that time, but 0.5 milliamp per watt means that the efficiency is about 0.1% or even lower than that. So still quantum efficiency is somewhere between 10 to the minus three and 10 to the minus four, and uh, for 3.5 detectors, it's still far from uh, being a real competition. So first, we had to understand why efficiency is still relatively low uh, compared to the 3.5. And then basically, if you look at the process here, so we have several processes. Uh, basically, we have an electron which is excited in the metal. And the excitation can, ta can take place in several uh, positions, depending on the evanescent tail of the plasmonic mode. So this is an illustration of the evanescent tail. And an electron will be excited here. Uh, again, sufficient energy. And <clears throat> there is probability, uh, some probability, finite probability, that it will arrive at the boundary between the metal and the silicon. Uh, this is the probability for normal incidence. Actually, there are other angles with lower probability. And then the question whether it's going actually to be transmitted into the silicon. And actually, the, the chances 
for this electron to cross the barrier, the chances are not so high. Uh, <clears throat> and that's because of the huge momentum mismatch uh, between the momentum of the electron in the metal, which is basically uh, related to the Fermi level of the metal, and the momentum of the, uh, of the electron in the semiconductor, in the silicon, which is very low. <clears throat> so I I'm not going to go over all these calculations, but basically what is shown here is that the probability is very low, and that's because of the momentum mismatch. So when we think of momentum mismatch in optics, we think, okay, let's do some random structures, grating, or something like that. And actually, uh, Eli, in his first talk today, was talking about that, about uh, the roughness in the solar cell and how much it actually improves the efficiency of solar cell. So uh, basically, it's the same here. I've shown you specular reflection versus some scattering. And maybe by some kind of roughness, we can have some scattering event and improve our, uh, the chances of an electron to go into the uh, silicon. <clears throat> and the answer for that was actually given by accident. So in, some of our, in one of our devices, uh, <clears throat> we removed the oxide which was protecting the sidewall of the, of the waveguide. Now, please keep in mind, the top surface of the waveguide is atomically flat. They use kind of a CMP, chemical mechanic mechanical polishing process, which keeps the uh, layer atomically flat. On the sidewalls, in spite of the fact that we are using locus process, which is kind of optically flat, it's not flat on the atomic scale. It still has a rough, uh, some kind of roughness, which is, for the electron, it's a significant roughness. <clears throat> so indeed, we have measured uh, responsivity in this kind of devices, and we are talking about responsivity of uh, 10, 20, maybe even 40 milliamp per watt for this kind of device, whereas before we had something like 0.5 milliamp per watt. So definitely kind of two orders of magnitude uh, improvement, and we attribute this improvement to the uh, addition of sidewalls and to this uh, roughness. <coughs> uh, we also use some kind of measurements in order to understand exactly how much light is actually absorbed in the structure because, as you can see, it was only one micron length of a device, meaning that some of the light was actually propagating through the device, some of the light was reflected, some was radiated. So we have conducted some series of ensemble near-field measurements in order to understand how much light was actually absorbed in the device. From these kind of measurements, we could extract exactly, I wouldn't say exactly, but nearly what is the responsivity of our device. We also have checked uh, spectral response comparing to external detectors. Uh, and we are now integrating these kind of uh, detectors on a chip for some kind of tapping applications. Uh, <clears throat> what's next? We have several ideas for, for, for uh, our next generation. One actually of them is using all kind of nano antennas and, and tips. For example, a structure like that. We have recently, oh, in last year or two years ago, we have demonstrated uh, squeezing of electromagnetic energy into apex of uh, silicon tips surrounded by metal. This was uh, following the proposal of uh, Mayor Ornstein from 2006. And actually, this kind of structure is different from the uh, structure by uh, Mark Stockman because for Mark Stockman, it's the metal tip which is going down, and then you need actually an anti-symmetric mode to support uh, the confinement of energy. But with this kind of structure, it's the fundamental waveguide mode which is coupled to a non uh, a mode without any cutoff. And that's why we can actually end up with high efficiency uh, concentration of energy at the apex of the tip. Uh, this was our optical results. And very lately, we also measured some temperature at the apex of, of the tip. And that's about 13 uh, degrees higher for only one milliwatt of light, which is uh, coupled from the, uh, from the fiber. So uh, there is also hope for another detection mechanism based on temperature with these kind of structures. We also believe that it will be relatively fast in spite of the fact that it's a thermal effect. So with that, I'm coming into my conclusions. Basically, I've shown you that silicon plasmonics can be used for uh, construction of uh, photodetectors for telecom wavelength regime. For now, we have uh, demonstrated efficiency, quantum efficiency in the order of 3 to 4 percent. Uh, we believe we can do better, so that would be one of our goals to improve efficiency with several designs. Uh, we will look, we'll be looking at high speed, uh, of course, on-chip integration, and some additional detection uh, mechanism. And finally, we would like to use this concept also for focal plane 
uh, arrays. I'd like to uh, acknowledge funding from FDA, come in, and BSF. Thank you.